Good morning. Uh, so my name is Christopher Main. Uh, Mr. Kirby is Chris, uh, and I'm a developer here at the NIH Center, um, where I specifically well I do lots of things, but one of the things I do is work on parameterization of small molecules. Um, and this is a little bit because of my background is I'm actually trained as a synthetic chemist, so I got my degree standing in front of a fume hood, um, and then uh, for my postdoc. Uh, I wanted to do something computational, and so Ahmad asked me to come work in his lab. And I showed up and was all ready to simulate some of the molecules that I had been making. Um, and Ahmad said, this is great. It's going to be really exciting. Uh, what force field do you have for your molecules? And I said, well, no, isn't that what you're supposed to give me? Like, I'm bringing the molecule to the show. You guys give me the force field, and we can do this together. And what I found out pretty quickly is that um, the parameterization of small molecules is a huge barrier towards the application of simulations um, fields such as drug discovery, which is where I was coming from and what I continue to be interested in. So out of necessity, um, I had to become a force field developer and uh, wrote some code in this plugin in DMD called the Force Field Toolkit, which uh, I've used as a user, but also developed for others to use as a way of simplifying the process of developing these parameters. Um, but critically, that this isn't a black box approach. Um, there are other tools that take that approach, and we take a little bit more hands-on approach um, to enable to give more robust parameters and to give users some idea of where the parameters might have uh, sticking points, um, because not all set of parameters are always going to be correct. So it's good to at least know where your liabilities are. So today, I was going to tell you a little bit about uh, force fields um, and a little bit about my code. I won't take you through all of it. because It's actually quite a large and complicated program, um, but I'll show you the types of things that it can do. Uh, and if you have any questions along the way, don't want to get bogged down, but I'm happy to, to talk about it. This is a pretty informal setting. Um, uh, again, so this is uh, developed uh, here at the center under uh, Ahmad tutelage, but also in collaboration with uh, JC Gumbard who's a former graduate student here who is now an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Um, so as you've hopefully been, been learning and taking in this morning, uh, classical molecular simulations are driven uh, by uh, this potential energy term, which is broadly comprised of bonded terms and non-bonded terms. And one example of this, the one that we use most frequently in our lab, is the charm force field. So we convert this a little bit more explicitly this is what the force field kind of looks like, and hopefully you've seen this this morning a little bit. Um, okay, so critically in here, what I've highlighted in red is that every k is a force constant, and every r0, theta0 is an equilibrium distance. And so for every pair of atoms that are bonded together in your system, you have to define these two terms. For every three consecutive types of atoms, you have to define these three terms. So you're probably thinking, holy cow, this is going to expand to a huge number of terms. Um, how does this even work in the first place? Um, and the, the answer is that there have been uh, people working on this problem for decades. And they take advantage of something called a parameter transferability, or the principle of transferability. And this is the idea that a given set of parameters um, can describe the molecular behavior over a variety of different chemical connectivities and spatial, so uh, conformational contexts. And this works really well in polymers. So things like, uh, particularly biopolymers, like peptides and proteins and nucleic acids. And kind of the feature that these two biopolymers have in common is that there's a standard repetitive backbone unit, which is decorated by these side chains, which are in large part kind of isolated from each other. So when you have one residue bound to another residue, the parameters don't really change depending upon what your sequence is. Right? They're all kind of internally consistent. And so by doing this, you can develop a limited set of uh, building blocks, which you can then put together to describe a huge diversity and complexity of systems, as we've seen for proteins and nucleic acids, carbohydrates, things, things like this. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of free thinking to realize that there are going to be some limitations or some places in biology or chemistry that we're interested in where this doesn't apply. And parameterization, as I found out, um, and others as well, is really an impasse. It's a, it's a showstopper. If you don't have parameters, you can't run your simulation. 
And so just a couple of examples where this uh, comes up is non-standard or engineered amino acids, small molecule ligands, which is where I come into play, but also complicated cofactors or metal centers. These are things that are not well described by the existing parameter sets for biopolymers. Um, and so this is where uh, parameterization comes into play. And um, it, conceptually speaking, it's not that difficult. So here's the workflow where you have some idea about your topology and your coordinates. You have to do some preparation, and then you just compute some charges, some bonds and angles and torsions, and out of this pops your parameter file. Okay, not that big of a deal. This is what I thought when I showed up here. Uh, but then you start reading the literature and looking at what are the details of this. And actually, this workflow is significantly more complicated. Um, and so what you can see here is now you've got various quantum mechanical calculations. Now you've got various multidimensional optimizations. And what you may or may not see from this is that every step in here requires a fairly complicated calculation. And then based off that calculation, you have to make some decisions and perform some sort of action. Right? So what just a moment ago looked relatively straightforward is now much more complex. Um, and so what we've just done is develop the force field toolkit as a graphical user interface that kind of sits over this workflow and helps you move through the workflow uh, by automating some of the more rigorous or tedious tasks. Or, uh, tasks. But critically, as I said before, this is not a black box. So we don't hide the data that's, that's underneath it and what's going on underneath it. Um, so as I said, um, this sits on top of the workflow. It's organized in tabs, generally moving from left to right. Within each tab, uh, we provide kind of standard user interaction paradigms, such as uh, file dialogs, buttons, menus. You know, this looks like any other application on your computer. Um, and it actually contains a, a huge amount of functionality inside of it. But there's really kind of three core functions that it currently provides. Um, the first of these is setting up and performing these multidimensional optimizations. Um, these optimizations are driven by quantum mechanical target data. So we try and abstract the process of setting up the input and the output of that, of that data. Um, but I will note that uh, we don't provide access to the actual quantum mechanical software. You have to use Gaussian um, kind of as a standalone. And then what sets us apart from a lot of other parameterization codes is that we provide the ability to assess the performance of these parameters and the performance of your optimization by visualizing data so that you can see, is your parameterization going well? Is it going poorly? You can look into the data and figure out where the sticking points are, as opposed to just spitting back a number and you're saying, oh, OK. Um, uh, and then there's a, a huge variety of other functions, which I call support functions, which just kind of simplify and automate very kind of simple tasks. Um, which can really slow you down uh, in the process of doing this kind of core functions. And so I don't have time to go through the whole toolkit today, um, but I do want to show just one step, which is indicative um, and exemplary of the types of things that FFTK can do and how it can help you in parameterizing uh, small molecules. And this is going to be a charge optimization, which requires uh, computing water interaction energies. This is done in a quantum mechanical level. And then we use this as target data for a multidimensional optimization. Um, so as a chemist, those are pretty like fancy words, but I'll show you kind of what they mean. Uh, so the preceding step, one has to go through a geometry optimization. And this is just to get kind of a low energy confirmation as a reference structure, which you're going to work from from the rest of the, the workflow. Um, and so uh, another feature of FFTK is because it's a plugin within VMD, it really works with the graphics, the graphical capabilities that VMD provides. So in the main VMD window, you can load in your optimized uh, structure, and you can visually see it. And then my plugin sits next to it, and this is one of the kind of relevant boxes pulled out of it. Um, so you can see you just point it to where your PSF and your optimized PDB are. Um, and then you can uh, load this structure into, into the VMD. Um, so the first thing we have to do is define the interaction sites where the water uh, can interact with, with the molecule. Um, and these come in two different flavors. Uh, the first of which is as a hydrogen bond donor, so the oxygen is interacting with your site, or a hydrogen bond acceptor, where the hydrogen is interacting with your molecule. Um, and we also provide things, so like here's one of the kind of support functions, which is an auto detection, which is a pretty simplistic algorithm, but it can rapidly just go ahead and assign different interaction sites 
and then it provides access for you to go in and change these things as you see fit. You can also just you can skip the automated part. You can just manually describe it, um, and then you can toggle uh, labels and the, the sphere visualization so that you can kind of see what you're doing instead of just blindly entering numbers into a box. So once you've defined these interaction sites, um, FFTK then uh, can generate the necessary input files. And what we're doing is positioning water such that they interact with the sites we've specified using a geometry that can optimize the distance of that water interaction and this rotation around that distance vector um, to optimize the water placement. So you're basically trying to find an energy minimum where the water is going to interact with that particular site. Um, and we provide an algorithm that goes through the geometries of this molecule and kind of computes where these water molecules can be, and then it writes the necessary input files for you um, just by clicking you know, write Gaussian input files. And then you can check our work by loading in the Gaussian files, and this is what is visualized here. So this is one, two, three, four, five, ten different calculations that I'm kind of superimposing on one structure um, that you can then run wherever you have access to Gaussian. And then when you're done, uh, you can check to see that those water, that optimization proceeded appropriately by loading in the log files, and it will look something like this. And what you want to see is that the water molecules all settle in to an energy minimum that's within reasonable interaction distance of your molecule. There are times when water will fly off into space, and that just means that there's no interaction minima there, um, which means that you've either misidentified the site as an acceptor or donor, or sometimes if you have really complicated three-dimensional structures, you can get steric clashes from other parts of the molecule, and you'll have to deal with those as, as they come up. But at least here you can, you can visualize those <coughs> in the process. <coughs> okay, so once you have that data, uh, target data, we can move on to the charge optimization stage. Um, so this is schematically what happens. Um, so in the user interface, you'll set up the optimization. And this is pretty straightforward. You just tell it where your PSF is, your PDB is, you tell it where all of your uh, quantum mechanical data is from your calculations, which we just computed. Um, and then you click a button that says go, and then everything inside this blue box happens behind the scenes. And so what it's going to do is it's going to load in your target data, and it's going to prepare um, some different data structures. And then it enters the optimization uh, phase, where it's going to assign a set of charges that you're trying to optimize. It's then going to compute some molecular mechanics functions, which are fed in to an objective score. And then it's going to reassign charges based off the score, and it's going to try and minimize the score. Um, and so it's going to iterate here, and then eventually it'll spit out your optimized charges, but also a variety of other data, um, such as these interaction energies and distances, uh, which you can analyze and then either choose to retune your optimization, or you can write these charges out to your PSF, and you're done. So what is this objective function doing? Um, so it consists of three different terms. Uh, the first of which is looking at the difference between the interaction energy computed from the quantum mechanical target data and the molecular mechanics as a function of your assigned charges. Um, it's also going to look at the distance at which these energies are minimized, so the minima. Um, and then it's going to look at the molecular quantity of dipole moment. Um, and you can tune these, and I'll talk about how you can tune these a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so essentially what you're doing is you're looking at water interaction profiles. And so here's an example where we have one water molecule, and we're going to shift it uh, closer and further from this nitrogen um, here and look at the interaction profile along that, that shift. And so with our first set of charges, we start here. So this is going to be the difference in the molecular mechanics energy versus the quantum mechanical energy, and then the dif difference where that distance is minimized. Um, and so we compute this interaction looks like this. Here's the minimum. And then as we iterate through the different charges, we eventually approach, we overshoot, and then we come back um, in the final optimized charges shown in blue. And comparing this against the literature charges shown in red, you can see that optimized pretty well. So this is an example of one site where we're performing this optimization. But we're actually simultaneously solving this for all the different interactions. So here's another example of this pyrrolidine molecule where we're looking at all these different interaction sites. Um, and uh, what you can see is as we proceed through a simulated annealing process, uh, starting from red and then converging ter towards magenta, we can see that we're optimizing these interaction potentials across all these different interactions at the same time. And this is a hallmark of a good um, optimization where everything kind of settles in around zero, zero, which means that the molecular mechanics is accurately matching 
uh, the quantum mechanical target data. Uh, so once you've run this optimization, I said it's important to go back and analyze it to see, did the optimization proceed well? Are the charges accurately reproducing the quantum mechanical target data? Um, and so we provide a tool um, where you can plot this optimization data and visually inspect it. So here what you're doing is uh, looking at the objective function. So it starts very high, and then at the end of the optimization it's very low. Again, this is a hallmark of a successful optimization. But we can delve a little bit deeper, and we can split this into the three different terms that I showed you, and we can plot those contributions to the objective function. So here, red is the energetics term, blue is the distance term, and green is the dipole moment. And so you can see that all of these converge towards a low score, and at the end, it's actually the distance that is uh, contributing the most to the objective function. Um, so you can, you can determine where kind of your largest contributions are coming from. But we can go even further and look at specific water interactions, and so here we can look at, say, the interaction with the nitrogen or the uh, polar proton or the polar hydrogen on the nitrogen, and you can look at the difference in the interaction energies um, relative to their quantum mechanical. So you see at first the charges aren't accurately representing this, and at the end you're matching the quantum mechanical very well for these specific interactions. And then you can also look at the distance at which this is occurring as well. So you can really drill down to specific interactions and try and find liabilities where your parameters might not be working um, to either tune your optimization or to just be aware that your parameters do have liabilities in them. Um, and finally, because uh, presentation is important, you can actually directly export this data um, as XY coordinates and then you can pull that into whatever plotting utility you like so that you can make uh, presentation or publication quality uh, graphs. Um, so this is not just a toy, right? We're actually using this to do real science. Um, and some pretty exciting science, uh, I think. Um, so some examples of how we've used uh, this is parameterizing volatile anesthetics, and we first looked at how they partition into membranes, um, and more recently, this was actually accepted yesterday, um, we've shown how these uh, anesthetics can partition the membrane and then bind ion channels, and this is how um, anesthetics work, or at least the volatile ones work. We've also looked at how uh, HIV drugs target the HIV capsid, um, and we can use this for uh, doing XMDFF, which I don't know if you've learned about yet or not, um, but it's a way of solving uh, low resolution crystal structures or uh, cryo-EM data. Um, but we've also taken this on to look at uh, the dynamics of abiological polymers. So this is kind of materials chemistry uh, or material science type work. Uh, so there are a couple of new features, well new as of the fall that I wanted to point out, um, which help uh, a lot of newer users, but also I use these at almost every day. Um, one is that rather than just starting from nowhere, you have no idea what parameters, you just set everything to zero and hope it falls into place, is that we can take advantage of something called the CGNF uh, program, which is a web server that will assign parameters based on analogy um, to the charm general force field. Um, and it also returns certain penalty scores, which tell you a good idea of whether your molecule is highly analogous to something that's already parameterized or not. And typically when you take this type of output, uh, which is developed by uh, Alex McCarroll's lab at University of Maryland, uh, what you need to do is you either need to uh, validate the parameters, or if the penalty scores are too high, they suggest you do some rigorous parameterization to check those parameters. And so what we can do um, is actually pull in, so you provide us the input that you give to the web server, and then the output the web server gives you. And you can do a couple of things. The first thing is you can actually construct your PSF PDB file pair automatically. Um, now that seems a little bit trivial, but based off the number of MD experts in our lab that come to my office, <laughs> clueless about how to do this, it's actually quite useful. Um, and so you can you can generate your, your file pairs. You can also load it loads in all of the missing parameters, um, their values, but also the penalty scores that uh, CGNFF has provided them. And then by clicking on these items again, we're going to harness the, the graphical capabilities of VMD. And you can see where these parameters exist in your molecule. So you have an idea of, again, where you have problems and where you don't have problems. Um, so this is an example of a bond that I need to work on, some angles and some dihedrals. Um, and these are actually designed so you can overlay them all at once and then get a full view of where uh, your parameters are missing. Um, so this is actually pretty powerful. And then you can actually start your optimizations from these initial guesses that are provided by the web server. So you're not starting from zero, you're starting from a, a pretty decent guess in most places. 
and that will help your convergence. Um, so the, the other thing that we've come across is that when, when scanning dihedrals, uh, you can get strange secondary interactions or tertiary interactions with your molecule that give you um, these kind of like microstructures uh, in your uh, torsional potential energy scans. And this can be problematic when trying to fit dihedrals. Um, and sometimes uh, you come across where you just can't get the molecular mechanics profile to match the quantum mechanics, and it's usually because of these contaminating interactions. And these can be very hard to track down if you don't have a way of visualizing this. Um, so here, what you can do is load in your molecule, and you can load in all of your target data. And so this will provide a graphical output plotting what your quantum mechanical potential energy surface looks like. And then in VMD, again, we're going to harness the graphical power of it. And you can visualize um, at any point along this energy surface what is the molecular conformation and what dihedral is being scanned over that, that particular part of the energy surface. Um, and so this color will co correspond to the graph. And then you can track down, OK, so there's like a, you know, where you're having problems with your molecular mechanics, you can go to the quantum mechanical conformation and say, all right, this is the conformation I'm struggling with and try to figure out why is the molecular mechanics not working. Um, and so this can, again, seems a little bit abstract, but it can help you track down places where your fits are not performing like you would, you would have figured. Okay, so in conclusion, um, hopefully I've convinced you that parameterization is actually quite complex, um, but we provided uh, a toolkit that helps you traverse the workflows that are necessary. We've tried to remove all of the places where we can automate things, like placing water, I used to have to hand write where those waters were. Don't have to do that anymore. Um, so we've simplified some of the workflow. Um, we've also provided a lot of opportunity, and this is something I didn't mention a whole lot, but you can customize things like how many processors the quantum mechanical calculation uses, how heavily you weight different terms in your optimization function. There are lots of places where you can go in and tune uh, your optimization. So we provide a lot of customization, uh, but also analytical tools so that you have an idea of uh, what is actually going on. Yeah. So <clears throat> what's important is to have also some uh, experimental data for some particular chemical properties. So that's typically we use that for benchmarking parameters. So um, FFTK doesn't pull experimental data in for the process of parameterization. It stays kind of true to the, uh, the principles of charm parameterization. Um, but what you can do is once you have those parameters, uh, you can run a simulation uh, that gives you a measurable that you can compare against experimental data. So uh, what we typically do is like an enthalpy of vaporization, or kind of the gold standard is a free energy of solvation if you have that data. Um, so if you've got some sort of physical chemical data, you can use that as validation of your parameters. And if you see that there's a mismatch, then you can go back to the parameterization process and try and tune that so that it, it works. But we don't use that directly as target data. Um, there are other programs that can take that into account, but we don't. We don't. OK, so my last slide is, um, so we have a publication that kind of details all of this, um, how the plugin works. It's available, um, it's been in it since 192. The latest one, 193, has kind of the new features that I talked about. Um, we have full documentation in a variety of different tutorials. One of them is a series of screencasts, if you just want to kick back and watch me do it. Um, and another one is a paper tutorial, so then you can actually get hands on and work, work through the tutorial yourself and do this. Um, and also a, a highlight that kind of shows uh, different features. Um, so thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to, to take any questions. So do you generally do only for uh, neutral molecules? Or? No, you can do charged molecules. There's a couple of minor tweaks you have to do. So when you're doing charge optimizations, um, we typically scale the interaction energy by 1.16, um, which is prescribed by the charm force field. And when you switch to a, a charged molecule, you reduce that back to 1. So there's a, a few little tweaks. Um, but yeah, we can handle charged molecules. Even uh, some phase and phosphorus. Yes, in principle, yeah. Um, I will say that charged molecules get a little bit more complicated when you go to uh, integer charges greater than one. So you typically want to try and fragment your molecule into model compounds that only have a single charge. Um, because once you have multiple charges, you get really strong uh, contaminating interactions. And that can really complicate your, your optimization. So I need to break and build a three-bill setup. 
Yeah, so typically if you have a large small molecule, um, and by large small molecule I mean larger than maybe 20 atoms, 20 heavy atoms, then you need to consider what we call the divide and conquer approach, which is uh, where you find natural places in your molecule where you can break it apart into model compounds. You parameterize the model compounds, and then you use those parameter sets to describe the larger compound. It's, in principle, it sounds very straightforward. In practice, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, some of these quantum mechanical calculations that we do are uh, very heavy. And so beyond about 20 heavy atoms, um, it, it goes from running in a day to running in weeks. So it, it really behooves you to fragment it down to a model compound if, if you can do that. There's a question in there. Um, so how useful do you think FFP technique is for experimental binding sites? Metal binding sites. Yeah, so uh, I have steered clear of inorganic chemistry my entire life. <laughs> um, but there are people, I know J.C. Gumbart, who is also um, a developer here at Georgia Tech, is, is actually working on metal sites and, and certain proteins. Um, the, the complication with metals is that they have complicated electronic structures, right? But in a classical molecular mechanics approach, we just use point charges. So we, don't, we can't represent that complex electronic structure to get the proper chelation in different ligand states. And so what you have to do is um, kind of hard code those in and in terms of bonds and angles. Um, but you can, in principle, use FFTK to parameterize metal centers. Um, there are various papers on how to parameterize metals for a charm force field um, that should basically outline this. But it's, you know, it's not 100% uh, straightforward, but it's, you know, people have worked on this. Is there a question over? Charles? Yeah, so the water molecules when doing the, the quantum calculations for charge interactions, uh, they're all separate. Um, so the other part of why we scale interaction energies for neutral molecules is because we're computing these in vapor phase, right? Quantum mechanical calculation is a vapor phase calculation. And this is the empirically derived scaling factor to get back to uh, represent condensed phase physics in the kind of the, the sense that we typically use um, these molecular mechanics force fields. So I've, I've shown them projected, all the calculations projected on one, so it looks like they're all at the same time, but they're, they're all done individually. Yeah. So is it applicable for nanostructure systems like graphene? Yeah, so the, the problem with nanostructures in terms of like uh, graphene and other Oh, yes. So the question is, um, is this applicable to uh, nanostructures and, yeah. and materials like graphene? Um, and uh, the, the problem with those types of structures is they have uh, really long-reaching electronic structures that overlap. Um, and so that is difficult to represent in fixed charge force fields because something like graphene or C60, um, it's all carbon, it's all a single, it's composed of a single type of atom. Uh, and so if it's neutral, then all the atoms have a charge of zero and you, you don't get the, the kind of polarization and the electronic um, kind of complexity that spreads over the material. Um, I do know that there are carbon nanotube uh, simulations and force fields and ways of, of dealing with this, um, but it is a little bit. Do you see an alternative for that? I think Charm, Charm has a Charm force field for carbon nanotubes, right? I mean, we have a tutorial on this, so <laughs> I haven't done that. <laughs> I mean, in that case, it's a neutral carbon. There is no it's, just a, it's just a Van der just a Van der Waals with uh, a... Yeah. So uh, you know that'll capture some of it, right? It'll be it can be rigid and it will have a Leonard Jones potential, but you know these a, lo a lot of these kind of material science large scale structures have they get a lot of their interesting properties from electronics, and that's something that is not well handled by fixed charge force fields in general. So you're going to see more examples tomorrow from Alex's presentation yeah. of inorganic material. Silicon-based stuff. So you see some examples, and 
they, they, there is an inorganic field that is being used right. that allows you to put certain shapes and new material. So, but beyond that, you need to know essentially how you would like to represent these concepts. These are very different concepts. Okay. okay. I'll be around this afternoon um, if you guys are working on the FMCK tutorial. If you have any molecules that you're interested in and curious about parameterizing, I'm, I won't do your work for you, but I'll have, I'm happy to consult and uh, tell you kind of what, what I think you'll have to do and, and those kinds of things. So I'll, I'll be around if anybody has any specific questions to their, to their research. I have one general question. Yeah. It's not related to this. It's related to the previous talk. So uh, we have a different version of force field, right? Different types of force field. Yeah. So when you do simulation for the same protein but with different force field, will you have exactly the same result or not? Well, so the, the question is if you do. The question is uh, you have a different version of force field, right? Like 36, 27 for jam or maybe uh -huh. mass amber. Uh, you do simulation of your system with the uh, same system but with different force field. Will you have exactly the same result or not? No. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, so the difference is the difference is within the charm force field. So in do. different version also, you'll not have same result. Uh, it, it depends on what has changed in the force field. So I know going from 27 to 36, there are major improvements in lipids. A lot. I can yeah. tell you about. And so if you're doing a membrane simulation, your results will be very different. different. But if you're doing a protein simulation, I think there's changes in the empty fixed terms uh, mm -hmm. for interactions with charged, uh, like acidic residues and ions. So those interactions will be different. But and did CMAP change? I think I think they had some change. So it's yeah, like uh, the paper which has published with 37 charm force field. If it do again with 36, then it's totally different. Well, I mean, totally <laughs> different. Yes, yeah. the exact numbers you get in the file is going to be different. But yeah. maybe your protein still has an RNA of about two angstrom. So maybe the some properties you were looking at are not sensitive to the detail changes in the force field. But if the results are not going to be the same. There is no question about that. So, but again, maybe these are so minor they don't care. Depends. Yeah. I mean, microscopic versus macroscopic. Yeah. Right. Like the microscopic part, they'll jiggle differently. Yeah. Whether that leads to an aggregate you know, summation where you get different dynamics, <laughs> then, yeah, I think then people may think like, why do they trust in this? Right? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, no, no, no. I think on the microscopic level, uh, you know, I mean, if you do enough sampling, so you should essentially get that solvent. But you, that's true for experiments as well. You, know, I mean, you yeah. look at the experimental results. Um, depending on the day you do your experiment, your rat behaves differently. So, what are you going to say? I'm not going to trust. So, but actually, the, the better question is probably so, why would you want to use different force fields for different simulations, right? I mean, sometimes you run a simulation, by the time you want to publish it, now there is a new force field out there in the market, and now the referee asks, oh, why did you use that force field? Yeah. Use this one and repeat all of your and microscope yeah. simulations. Yeah. Don't yeah. give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so is, is it like always better to use a recent one? Of course, I mean, there is a reason there is a more recent, you could argue that it has not been tested enough, maybe I should wait, so you could argue that way. If you are not using too old version of the force field, people understand. You have been doing this simulation last year or so. It's still acceptable. But if there are, let's say you have been looking at lipids, and we know that lipids freeze if you use charm 27 or earlier versions, microsecond simulation, they're going to go through a gel phase. We know that. And you're publishing a paper saying that, oh, here is my simulation. I show the lipid phase transition temperature is this or that, obviously people are going to tell you, no, sorry, 27 to or you know there was a problem for that. It also depends on what you're looking at. So forces are not perfect. Uh, people constantly try to revise them and make them better. Uh, as we can run longer simulation, we see more sort of uh, imperfections in the forces. We go back to the drawing board, use a more complex model compounds to describe particular behaviors, electronic phenomena that we know are important are somehow include the polarizability. So they're constantly improving this. Uh, so I guess uh, maybe you should 
publish your results as quickly as you yeah. can. <laughs> Don't sit on them for two years and now I'm going to publish and nobody takes them. So that's uh, something to remember. Yeah. So yeah. if parameters on the post fields are updated with regard to the published experimental data, right? There are different ways of validating sort of force fields or optimizing them and tuning them. So yeah, so the, I had one example. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to talk about it. This this is about lipids. So one thing that happened was that when they simulated lipids in the presence of proteins, they uh, they knew that unsaturated lipids interact more closely with the protein, but it, this didn't come out the simulation. So then they went back. And instead of using very small model compounds, they extended it to a larger model compound and showed that there are there are complex electronic kind of phenomena underlying the different conformational uh, distribution of, of the lipids. And then they included this back by having multiple torsional angles, the torsion angle potentials, they could recover that aspect. So there are always things that don't look right because either you know experiment or you know some qualitative behavior that is not coming out of your simulation and make you think, how can I include this? So the, the NB fix example I mentioned for the ion protein interaction is another example. So people, this was too strong. This was sticking too much. And I know it shouldn't be like that. So they went back and tried to fix that. So this, this happens all the time. You could be dealing with a system in which you observe for the first time something, some bad effect of, of the current force field, and then you might fix it and just publish a paper on that particular aspect. This is wrong, guys. Be careful every time you have a carbonyl and, I don't know, a cation close, something bad might happen. Yeah, so this is, again, I mean, these are very, very approximate descriptions of, a, of very complex systems and molecules. So, so you have to take them with a huge grain of different kinds of science. <laughs> yeah. Can FFTK like handle sulfur and phosphorus well? I know they're like much larger and they have more orbitals, so Yeah, the um, <clears throat> one of the limitations of FFTK is we don't uh, support parameterization of the data volume, so the life job potential. Um, so as long as those exist, uh, which they do for many of the sulfur and phosphorus, um, then we can support the parameterization of the rest of the, developing the rest of the parameters. And I mean, there's been a lot of work with uh, sulfur-containing compounds like sulfates as well as, as phosphorus um, that's in CGNSF already. And there are, I know McCarroll has a paper, I think two or three papers explicitly looking at Parameterization of sulfonamides and sulfones and sulfates. And, um, so that there are examples out there that where there are changes or if there are changes to parameterization, that that will be detailed in there. And FFGK can be flexible in terms of other things like what level of quantum theory you want to use and things of that nature um, that you can use to accommodate you know, maybe some use case that's a little bit more complicated or requires something different. This is a general question regarding MD. So I do a simulation to find the conformation sample. So when I do simulation, like the people who are having limited use of computation, uh, they don't have much resource. So how do they? They don't have much. Much like computation power. Okay. With minimal power, how one can achieve maximum sample? <laughs> You're asking one of those ten million dollar questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, you can't achieve good sampling with minimal computation. Sorry. No, like uh, instead of doing one long simulation for uh, oh, okay. 100 nanoseconds, uh -huh. I can do 15 for 10 nanoseconds. Then I can combine them so because the states are going to be different. They are going to sample different basins. So when I merge them. Will it work? I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. So you want to sample different basins separately. This is umbrella sampling, essentially what you're saying, a different way, not maybe a bias, but 
how to put them together. I don't know because if you don't have transition, you can't, you can't really put them together. Yeah. I mean, so there, are, there are methods of enhanced sampling, right? There's umbrella sampling, there's ABF, there's metadynamics, but those are all heavy calculations. They're not. You're not going to run your lab. Sorry. What I'm saying is, I do the same simulation, but I change the initial condition. By changing the velocity distribution, changing the cutoff, do something. Uh -huh. And so that the molecule doesn't see the same space, it goes to a different space. So when we combine, because now the system is the same, whatever the ensemble I do is the same. I see. Okay, no, I guess, uh, yes, so, right, so I mean, um, I usually teach three days sometimes of this workshop. The third day is all about what, what, one thing you are mentioning, and I'm glad you asked this question, is that, uh, uh, I mean, you started it in a different way. You said how I can minimize the computational demand of my sample. But what you're suggesting is how to maximize sampling so without relying on an MD to do everything for you. How, what else can you do to better sample the space? Let's, let's put it this way. And one thing that you <clears throat> alluded to and we always recommend is that to start with many, many different initial conditions. You mentioned different initial velocities of the same coordinates set, but you can, let's say, generate a membrane with the same lipid composition, but generated in five different ways. You have lipids randomly placed initially, very differently. One of them is here in this space, the other one's there, the other one's there, and then you put your protein in them, five or six or ten copies, put your protein in all of them, very different initial configuration, run them all in parallel, which can be done more efficiently on supercomputer centers. Instead of one simulation trying to sample everything, now you have five different starting points. And that allows you to maybe capture interesting events in your in your data sets. So that's one way. Or let's say in some cases, uh, I should mention this, you are not sure about your PKA, about the protonation state of the CCD. Is it really protonated, not protonated, instead of spending a year trying to come up with a fancy way of uh, deriving it or sort of figuring it out, you can run two simulations, one with protonated, one with unprotonated, just to see what you see. And then that way you have covered both spaces, you know, lots of ligand. Or oh, is it going to be like this or like that? How can I figure this out? Just run both simulations. It's much, it's not too difficult to have multiple simulations if you can encourage to do that. So that's where you can really, not your total simulation time, you're still spending the same microsecond or so on your data set. But in terms of your time and quickly getting more information out of this one microsecond, so these are 